Welcome to The State of Us. Beyond mainstream cable news and party lines, with a millennial and a boomer, The State of Us pushes past the noise and uncovers all the issues that matter. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. We are definitely living in turbulent times, with an international pandemic changing many of our lives and renewed protest against racial injustice, we're facing some tough questions as a nation. But we don't shy away from challenging issues on The State of Us, and that's why today we're discussing racial bias in the public school system. It is a serious problem, and we need to look at what can be done to fix it. A recent book, Unconscious Bias in Schools, was written for school leadership as a guide and answers some of these questions. Lance Jackson, my co-host and an educator of 35 years, is the senior resident historian at TrueChat and is going to introduce our guests for today's program. Today we have two guests. In the second segment, we will talk with one of the principals at a public school making meaningful changes. And in the first segment, this one, we get to speak with a co-author of Unconscious Bias, Sarah Fireman. Sarah E. Fireman is currently the Director of Leadership Development with EL Education, a national nonprofit organization. She is also a former public school teacher and principal, as well as the author of several previous books. Sarah, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Lance. Sarah, the idea of discussing race and racism in our schools is one of those topics that a lot of people probably get anxious about when it's brought up uh, for any number of reasons. So help us understand what you mean when you talk about unconscious bias. Uh, What is it? And is it something that everyone experiences at some level? Yes, I would say we're really, we're all susceptible to unconscious bias. And I would love to just start by giving you an example that I think is really illustrative, but it is, it is actually not about race. It was a time when I was on jury duty and the defendant was a white man with a very Italian sounding name. And a few minutes after reading the charge, the judge turned to the jurors and asked us, have any of you already decided the defendant is guilty? And in that moment, I realized that I had decided that that man was guilty. And I was really shocked, actually, when I realized that. I, uh, the trial hadn't even started, and I already thought that the defendant was guilty. And so I sat there trying to figure out, why, how did I come to that conclusion already? And I realized, somewhat shamefacedly, that... I, I didn't know anyone Italian American. The only people I knew with names like that were people in movies about the mafia. And so I had unconsciously associated that man with criminal behavior, uh, even though I knew nothing else about him. So I had absorbed these beliefs, these unconscious biases about Italian Americans. And I hadn't even realized that. And so What we try to write about in this book, my co-author Tracy Benson and I, is that the same thing is going on all the time with race. In fact, um, psychologist Beverly Daniel Tatum has this great metaphor. She describes this as breathing in the smog of racism, something that all of us are doing all the time, just because we are so inundated in our society with media messages, sometimes really obvious overt ones, often much more subtle messages about black and brown people being less capable and more criminal. And none of us are wanting to absorb these biases, but they influence our behavior. And what we wrote about in the book is the way they influence us as educators to treat our black and brown students differently. And I actually would love to just address what you started your question with, Justin, when you said that naming racism can sometimes raise people's anxieties. And I think that's because the the word racist has come to be associated with intent. You know, if you're racist, you're actively seeking to do harm to people of color. And I think everybody, most of us would agree that that would be a bad person. And so when we're associating racism with intention, it would be only natural for us to get defensive if somebody says that we're, we're doing something racist. And so Tracy and I wrote this book because we worked with so many school leaders who saw this defensiveness, 
particularly in white people, coming up over and over again when school leaders were just wanting to talk about, look at these racial disparities and student achievement outcomes. What can we do about them? And this defensiveness would be a barrier to any conversation going forward. And so um, so we wanted to provide an entry point. And talking about unconscious bias, teaching white people like me that it's not about our intentions, um, that it's actually about these unconscious beliefs that we've absorbed. Once we start from that place, then it allows, it allows white educators to shift from focusing on their atten- intentions to really focusing on their actions and the way their actions may be unintentionally causing harm to the black and brown students that they care so much about. So this really helps educators um, align their actions with their intentions by recognizing the influence of these unconscious biases. Excellent point in making the definition there so people can understand where we're, what we're talking about. So many people might be willing to acknowledge that how we act based on race, especially in schools, could be doing harm to students, but they may not see it as a problem at their school or in their community. So how do we know that this unconscious bias is a real problem that the entire nation needs to address? It's important to start by recognizing that we have had hundreds of years in this country where it has been legal to treat Black people as less than human. My co-author Tracy likes to say that there are laws today protecting the way dogs are treated that are better than the laws uh, of Black people. Black people were, were treated worse than dogs are today. And that went on for hundreds of years. In fact, Black people were only guaranteed the right to vote in this country in 1965. That's not hundreds of years ago. That's really just a couple of generations. And of course, that, that right is very much under threat today. So I think first we have to just start by recognizing that level of deeply ingrained bigotry doesn't just get turned off like a light switch. There's a lot of work we're going to need to do as a country um, to really shift those deeply ingrained messages. Um, And there is a really robust body of research now that is showing that these unconscious biases that, again, have been fed for for hundreds of years, do affect our actions. So there's really a lot of research that um, unconscious bias affects all sectors of society. So in terms of health, there are studies that show that doctors are less likely to prescribe life-saving treatments for Black patients than for white patients with exactly the same symptoms. Um, In terms of Jobs, HR directors are more likely to call someone back if they think the person is white than if they think the person is black, even when those applicants have the exact same resume. Um, There's a really interesting study came out in 2012 in education where a group of researchers gave teachers uh, the same poorly written essay and asked the teachers to give feedback to the student. And when teachers thought that the student was white, they gave the student some critical feedback to help the student improve that poorly written essay. When the teachers thought that the student, based on the name, was black or brown, they gave only praise to that student, suggesting that they didn't think the student could do much better than this written essay. So there's just all sorts of insidious ways that this bias is showing up. Uh, and the research is really is really quite robust at this point. And it's really in every sector, um, which again, makes sense given our country's history and, and identifying this as an unconscious bias, our hope is that that can really shift our conversation. So we start to take responsibility for the impact that these biases have on the people that we in all these different sectors are seeking to serve. We talk a lot about, um, Sarah, on the state of us. Lance and I have had this discussion a number of times, um, you know, intentions versus actions, because from from all sides of things, understanding the difference between them is important. When we go to talk about an issue, understanding that what we're doing 
may be bad, but it's not that we meant it in a bad way. And that's important for both the person committing the action, but also the people receiving the action to understand that and make that differentiation. And you've kind of touched on this already, but um, I, I think it's important that we speak about it specifically because the state of us reaches a pretty broad audience. And some of our listeners subconsciously right now might be thinking, you know, okay, I'm buying into the idea that this is indeed a problem and that we should probably do something to address it. But why should I, you know, as somebody who's not directly affected by unconscious bias, why should I take time to care about this issue in depth? Isn't this a fight for somebody else? So what what can we do to help show people the personal stake that we all have, regardless of our race, in issues like unconscious bias? So a couple of things to begin with. First, I'm so thrilled that your listeners are tuning in to this topic. Um, so uh, it's really encouraging to see so much interest in understanding um, how racism and racial bias is affecting our country. Second, um, any of your listeners who are people of color already know very clearly um, why this is a personal issue. It's it's affecting them on a day to day um, on a day to day level. Um, and then I hear you asking, what about for um, our white listeners? Why should white listeners feel like this is personally affecting them? So one way to think about this question is to think about the economic costs if we don't prepare all of our students to be self-sufficient, contributing, critical thinking members of our society. We're clearly going to be held back. Uh, we, we need all of our children to grow up to contribute in positive ways to our society, to be inventors and architects and engineers and teachers and nurses and entrepreneurs and, you know, all sorts of people who are going to really help our country be healthy and prosperous. I mean, that is clear that that is only to the benefit of all of us. And then I would say another way of answering your question about why should I care about this personally is from the perspective of a sense of integrity and morals. And I, I'm guessing I am not the only white person who, when I read about the abolitionists who fought, the white abolitionists who fought to end slavery, or the white people who joined in the civil rights marches in the 1960s. When I read those stories, I usually put myself in the shoes of those white abolitionists or those white civil rights workers. I usually assume, oh yeah, if I had been around at that time, I clearly would have been one of those people on the right side of history. One of those people who clearly saw um, that this was wrong and needed to stand up for it. And I just, I think right now, I ask myself all the time, am I being a contemporary abolitionist? Am I being a contemporary civil rights leader? Um, because right now, my fellow citizens who are black and brown are being deprived of their fundamental rights as citizens, of their fundamental right to be treated with dignity, um, and I have a choice to be complacent with that or to stand up and recognize I cannot I cannot be a moral person if I am complacent. I have to take a stand against that. We've been talking with Sarah Fireman, author of Unconscious Bias in Schools, about the nature of unconscious bias and why it should matter to each of us. Thank you, Sarah, for taking some time to speak with us. Thank you so much for including this on your show. Really appreciate it, Justin and Lance. We've explored unconscious bias and at least scratched the surface, but a number of questions still remain. How do we use what we've learned to improve the lives of students? And what will make us successful now where we previously have not been? To answer these questions, we will be joined in the next segment by one of the principals at a school discussed in Sarah's book. Keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. Today, Lance and I have been talking about the nature of unconscious bias and why it should matter to all of us. And in this segment, we're going to examine how we can use what we've learned to improve the lives of students and what will make us successful now where we previously have not been. We now get to speak with Lana Cox. She is the middle school principal of the Capital City Public Charter School. 
has held numerous positions in public education and the nonprofit sector. And prior to that, was a humanities teacher for five years at an EL education school in Boston. Lena, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Lena, your school has seen some success in combating unconscious bias. Isn't one of the major challenges convincing people that the system is not set up for everyone? Uh, In other words, there's this line of thinking that essentially contends kids that follow the system are successful, so the kids... Uh, that aren't successful simply just need to follow the system and then they will be successful. So how have you sought to change this perception? The term system is a global statement because there are so many, right? So are we referring to education as a whole, um, the system of institutionalized racism and all of those implications? Um The system, though, as it was established, was created to replicate inequity, and it's working um, as it was designed. So it's integral to teach my students and to ensure that the teachers who teach my students understand everything they possibly can about this system. I believe it's my job as a school leader to design a culturally responsive space where my students see themselves in the curriculum and are not taught social justice as an extra ideal, but as the ideal. And so then I believe it's my responsibility or it's then the responsibility of my teachers to ensure that the students connect to the curriculum. I don't allow a teacher to simply say, oh, I taught it. That's just not how we do things. Students should experience the curriculum and it should have social impact that they are a part of. Teachers have to bring the curriculum outside of the classroom and into the world our students are currently living in. We are really you know, trying to build independent learners who think critically. We want them to be active learners and not passive receivers of information, especially when the information is a part of this system and it isn't always built to lift them up. So it's really important for teachers to also understand students' culture, but at a deeper level. An example would be just simply offering opportunities from those of us who come from oral traditions to have more chances to showcase their learning that way versus, say, a fixation on just written evidence. So and at my school, students have to orally present all of the time. They still write. They still determine how to provide evidence to what they're writing, but they also have to debate and they have to present their learning. And it's really critical, you know, for teachers to do the necessary equity and anti-racist work, not just to build a toolbox of strategies to use with students, but for them to do the real work of equity that needs to happen with themselves. Every single teacher standing in front of students, but especially teachers who are standing in front of black and brown students, need to really take an inner look at who they are and all they're bringing to that space. Teachers have to check their unconscious bias. They have to check their privilege. Privilege. And schools must force those conversations and that work because everything else comes after that. I couldn't agree with you more. And as an educator for about 35 years, I know that I've dealt with the, all of these issues that you've discussed and tried to do many of the things that you've talked about today. So a lot of this isn't, aren't new issues for educators. And even some of the solutions that you're talking about aren't all that new either. Many of us, not enough of us, but many of us have have tried all of this. So my question is, how do we stand a better chance of accomplishing this real change that we're we're discussing today um, than we did in the past? And what makes today's approach, you think, different from the previous methods? Or why do you think it will be more successful than it has been? You know, it's interesting because today's approach considering both the global pandemic and the racial epidemic that we're living in, it feels different. Um, I feel like quarantine has forced everyone to slow down and stop. And now those who didn't necessarily have their eyes open to the reality um, of black and brown people are showing a new level of investment with a a different and a sharper lens. 
it's reminiscent of what I feel the freedom fighters did in the 60s. Um, the major difference being that generation was confronting clear legal segregation. This generation has had to become hip to institutionalized racism that isn't clearly legislated. Police brutality, immigration rights. There's, you know, there's a new level of wokeness that is inspiring and, and really hopeful. Um, I also feel like we're being led by a youth movement of black and brown people that is really energizing me. Um, it's unique and special, and we need to make sure that we take the momentum of this moment and turn it into a movement. You know, although this generation does have to be watchful of the same traps of the past, there's this cautionary tale of simple consciousness raising of white people but it's really time to move beyond that. It's time to move beyond the words and the terms and move beyond just the book club, but actually doing the work and policies need to change. The defunding movement is an example of that. Um, we can't afford for whites to not be racist. They have to be anti-racist. And as an educator, it's our job to prepare young people to then step into that space with both historical context and new learning, given everything that they are dealing with in the world today. Lena, if if I understand correctly, and I do want you to tell me if if I don't extrapolate this correctly, but I think what you're saying is right from... From a white person's perspective, it's not enough to say, I'm not part of the problem, so I don't need to do anything. It's maybe I'm not, quote unquote, part of the problem, but I still have a responsibility to be an active part of making the positive change. Because if I'm not doing something to institute positive change, I'm perpetuating the problem by being complacent. Is that is that a fair extrapolation or or do I not have it quite? No, that's a fair extrapolation. Like it's it's just we we can't afford for um for white people to just say, you know, I feel bad for this situation or I I would never say that or I would never do that. I'm not racist. That's great. Now what? What are you going to do? With out with not being racist, you have to be anti-racist. You have to um, have these conversations with um, outside of the, the the choir of those who who are like you. You have to do the work. You have to push um, policies. You have to push not only just the conversation, but we have to push action. So I think like that's an exact summary of, of what I'm trying to say. Okay, good. I, I was hoping so. I just, I wanted to make sure that I, that I had it. Cause I think it, you know, for our listeners, we want to make sure that they understand the, the particulars of, and, and Lance and I talk about that a lot on all issues, just for what it's worth, because, um, you know, a lot of times people say, okay, well now I understand it. Um, but it's, you have to also be part of that positive change. You can't just sit on the sideline because change doesn't happen if we're not invested all of us in making it happen. Um, and after reading your book and, and hearing from you, uh, you know, have you been, you've been able to implement some of these meaningful changes. Uh, so the important question seems to be, how do we keep this going? I mean, and this is something Lance and I discussed quite a bit um, in our production meeting about this program is it's wonderful when we have administrators that want to do something about this. But one of the problems is that often, um, like in many jobs, uh, when an administrator moves or changes jobs, uh, the change dies with them. So how do we make sure that doesn't happen? How do we make sure that pitfall of the past doesn't continue to be a pitfall of today? That's a really good question. Um, because, you know, obviously no administrator wants to walk away from their school and think that it's going to fall apart or go backwards um, and not carry, carry on after all of the blood, sweat and tears that you've poured into it. Um, I do think one mistake that a lot of districts make is the move to, especially with leaders of color, um, the mistake is the move to simply recruit leaders of color, but then they don't do the work to sustain them and to really think about, you know, what it means, whether you're a leader of color in a predominantly um, white school, whether you're a leader of color 
in a predominantly, uh, you know, a school that is predominantly black and brown students, the work of sustaining a leader is critical. Um, and just, you know, overall, this country has so much work to do to professionalize um, the, the teaching and the, the educator profession at a high policy level. We need to make major adjustments in showing that this profession is valued. We need to be paid more. There should be an investment in our development, our growth, and our learning. Um, professional development and learning has to be rigorous. It has to be thoughtful and it has to be ongoing. And it's ironic that it's taking a quarantine to push many people to truly understanding just how essential educators are. At my school um, here in DC, we don't separate academic rigor from anti-racism work. So if you work in my school, you don't dichotomize. The principles of equity are the same about ensuring high quality, rigorous learning experiences for all students, because this is our core. We can have a certain amount of turnover that doesn't compromise the integrity of our core. That's our mission. That's our vision. That has been what has driven us as a school for 20 years in the district. And so that being the core of who we are and us ensuring that anyone who steps foot um, into our building uh, in this profession believes in that core and, and, and lives that core themselves that is how we're able to, whenever we do have to have transitions and turnover, that it doesn't get lost with whoever was leading that work. The next person picks it, you know, picks it back up. Um, I mean, generally, like you want to sustain and commit to lasting change, trust the leaders and invest in their growth and then allow them to invest in their teachers. Because I'm only as strong as I am as a school leader because of my amazing teachers. It's my job to build them and support their growth. That's who will be their best in front of my students. And the modeling has to start at the top. Um, so much of this is about cultivating. And really, cultivation is what leads to dynamic educators. I love that final statement that you're only as strong as your teachers, but your teachers depend on you to make them strong. And together, we can all be there uh, to create more productive students uh, who can then take this world to a better place. How can we use the lessons of unconscious bias in schools and the experience of Lena in our modern society and how might these observations better inform our conversations about today's leaders? That's what Justin and I will discuss in the next segment of the show. Lena, we appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule to speak with Justin and me. Thank you for having me. In the first segment, we got to speak with Sarah Fireman, the author of Unconscious Bias in Schools. The book featured examples of schools like Lena's where meaningful changes are being made. To learn more, visit thestateofus.org. How can we use the lessons of unconscious bias in schools in our modern society, and how might these observations better inform our conversations about today's leaders? To find out, keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. We are The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. In the first two segments of today's show, we had the opportunity to speak with Sarah Fireman and Lena Cox. Sarah is the author, one of the authors of Unconscious Bias in Schools, which was written as a guide for school leadership and seeks to answer questions about racial injustice. And Lena is actually mentioned in the book, her school, and about some of the things they're doing uh, to better prepare their students and to combat uh, unconscious bias. And Lance and I had some interesting conversations leading up to this. And I think this is our opportunity to just be, to be honest with listeners, because this is the part of the show where we get to, um, tell you what we think and, and share with you our thoughts. And, um, I, I won't speak for Lance, but we, we were able to speak in between the mid show break. And I know that for me, the conversation, um, even though, right, we're, we're talking to two people that, um, want to be part of the positive change and want to talk about it. I think for many of us, as I mentioned in the opening, race and racism tend to create a lot of anxiety for different reasons, for different people. Um, obviously, if you're on the receiving end of that, um, if you're somebody who's black or brown, those 
are very real things for you in a personal way. Um, and on a totally, in a totally different way, um, for a lot of white people who don't see themselves as racist, um, it can be challenging to talk about because none of us, I don't like to think about, I know Lance doesn't like to think about, we don't like to think about the possibility that even though I don't think Lance or I feel like there's a single part of our being that wants to be racist, right? That wants to look at people who are not white any differently than us. We don't want to look at them that way. It can be a real challenge. And I think that's for what it's, for what it's worth. I think Lance and I sincerely feel like that is, you know, most people in this country is that most people don't want to be a racist. Um, they're not trying actively, consciously trying to be a racist. And part of what's difficult when we confront issues like this is for those of us that don't feel like we're actively being racist, it can be uncomfortable to feel like we're getting called out in the unconscious ways that our actions are doing these things. And that's part of why I think it's tough. And that's part of why I think Lance and I probably feel um, more drained than we do after most conversations. I mean, I think Lance and I always try to put everything we've got into each show that we do. But with ones like this of these extra sensitive topics, Lance and I think badly want to get it right. And sometimes you have to accept that no matter how hard you try, you're not going to get it perfect. Um, so I'm hoping, Lance, that we've that we've done something today to show people, look, Lance and I are taking this on and accepting that that we're not perfect. And if we can do that, you can do that too at home. And that's that's got to be the first step, right? And the steps that follow that is not just acknowledge it, but then let's be part of the positive change. Let's not just you know, say, okay, well, we've learned about it and that's enough. Let's do something meaningful so that future generations aren't going through this. Well, I think the reason, I think there's so much anxiety when you talk about this is because there's a basic level of trust that's needed to talk about this issue among all parties. And because of some of the historical references that were talked about in the show and some of the modern day realities that we all have to deal with. It's very hard to think that we have that level of trust with people that we're talking to, that they will take us for, for what um, we are and that we are trying our best and that we do want to make changes and to understand that these unconscious biases occur on both sides. And so we're all trying to do the best we can to make it better because there are people, unfortunately, in our society who don't want to. They are taking these these biases and they're playing on them for their own and manipulating them for their own good or for furthering their own power base or their own institutions or their own businesses or, or, or whatever. I don't think that's the majority, but there are people that are doing that. So there's this initial level of trust that that's needed. And when you're meeting people for the first time, many times like students do in the classroom, you know, they meet a teacher for the first time, everybody's bringing in their, their previous experiences and you have to develop that level of trust so that, so that you can break down and be one, an effective educator for those students in your classroom. And two, the students need to break down their biases so that they can give that teacher then the opportunity to maybe do something that hasn't been done or needed to be done for them in the past that nobody ever did. And they get that bias. Well, all teachers say this or all teachers do this. And we're not all the same. So this is a really sensitive topic because the level of trust that needs to be there to have the discussion is not found very often in our society. We are very much, I think, um, not a trusting people because of things that we've seen happen in the last decade or so from financial crises to political upheavals to violence in the streets to violence on individuals. And um, it's just, there's not that level of trust that we need and we need to get that level of trust so we can have these discussions because the key here is, and I think, um, I think it was Sarah that said, and please, uh, you know, if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. But one of our two guests today said, we need this because 
we will only become a stronger nation if we strengthen all of our citizens. You know, there's the old saying, you're only as strong as your weakest link. You know, I use that all the time with my coaching. You know, as a team, it's not about the starters. It's about the player who plays the least amount of time. The better they are, the better everybody is, the better our entire team is. We need to work to make everybody better. So we have to, for whatever reason, whatever's holding people back who aren't being successful in the education system, we need to find out why that is that they're not being successful. We need to meet them where they are and bring them up because we need to bring them up to the the best level that they can attain because that's what's best for all of us. Whether you're a business person, whether um, you're another worker, a coworker, whether you're just an average citizen, all of us benefit if we raise the education standard of all of our citizens. We can't write off a group of citizens just because it's too hard or just because it's too tough or we don't know what to do. We have to find out what to do and we have to bring them up because that makes us a stronger country and it makes us a better country. It's funny how many times in the last, I don't know, ever since we had Andrianne on from uh, National Geographic with her book Cosmos that, uh, that example she gives of, you know, how trees in a forest, if, if one of them gets cut down, the others send this IV sugar tap to that other tree to, to try to support it and lift it up. And, uh, there's all these examples in nature, right? Where, um, objects that are both conscious and those that are not, uh, do things to support one another, um, almost instinctively. And I think it's unfortunate because a lot of times it seems that in our modern society, uh, we almost resist what should be naturally there, understanding that the success of all of us means that we can't be leaving people behind and we can't be ignoring problems. Uh, but not ignoring problems is a big part of what we try to do here at True Chat, right? And that's, uh, that's kind of what our mission statement is, is about because True Chat is a network of programs and the state of us is just one of those many podcast and radio programs. And we're all working to accomplish the same goal, all fighting for the same cause uh, to further that understanding amongst individuals and to bring attention to issues that people may not know about. So, Lance, what uh, what is that mission that True Chat is working on and the state of us is also trying to pursue? Well, our mission, and I think we hit it on the head today extremely well. We usually do it every day, but especially today. Our mission is to educate people by providing honest, open and respectful conversations. And if people want to spread the word because that's how we further that mission, right? We, uh, The more people that get involved, the more likely we are to affect that real meaningful change. What are some of the ways that people can, we need you to invite your friends to listen. And when you go to invite them to listen, you got to be sure to tell them exactly how they can tune in. And what are some of those ways, Lance? Well, you have my personal favorite, Spotify, along with Stitcher, an Apple podcast, and anywhere else fine podcasts are found. For the state of us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin C. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to our producer, Bradley Butch, as always. And thank you to both of our guests, Sarah Fireman and Lena Cox, today for joining us on the show. Thank you all for tuning in and keeping an open mind. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.